this time on Mega Shippers. In Glasgow, the weather causes problems for naval architect Heather Crockett, who's moving a £100 million ship down river. The winds unexpectedly picked up. Our limit for the move was uh, 21 to gust and 25 knots, so we're just over the limits. In Southampton, Barry Goshawk is loading urgent supplies for the Channel Islands, but a broken fuel pump means the cargo ship is stuck dockside. This is a high pressure situation and there is never a dull moment here. And in Leicestershire, half a million pounds worth of locomotive needs to be driven 180 miles to Somerset. But engineer Steve Moss has a big mechanical problem. So if you haven't got that steering arm in, you won't have any steer on the back. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value... If there's any damage, my neck's on the line. ..or high volume. One miscalculation... No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead! One change in conditions... It started to completely fell down. ..put spell disaster... Mother Nature stamped her feet. ..with reputations... And lives on the line. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the mega shippers. Govan Glasgow, in the west of Scotland. A shipyard with a 150-year history of building warships for the Royal Navy through the First and Second World Wars. For the last 20 years, the yard has been part of BAE Systems, who specialise in military craft. Their latest cutting-edge project? The 19-metre offshore patrol vessel known as an OPV. The newest version has taken two and a half years to build and is for the British Royal Navy. HMS Trent is part of a £635 million project for five new ships and their support. When complete, it will operate around Britain, undertaking maritime security, border control, counter-terrorism and fishery protection. Over the next five days, naval architect Heather Crockett is in charge of a complex move to get the vessel worth over £100 million safely from the build shed and floated for the first time. We are going to be launching the Royal Navy's new offshore patrol vessel. Um, rather than launching it down a slipway, we are going to be rolling it onto a barge and then we're going to take the barge downriver to a deep berth and we'll submerge the barge and then the ship will float off in a nice controlled fashion. Although it made for a great spectacle, the days of launching newly built ships down a steep slipway are in the past. One of the main reasons we don't tend to take them down the slipway anymore is there's a lot of uncontrolled factors for a dynamic launch. You don't know what your coefficient of friction is actually on the day. It can be quite risky. With a dynamic launch, once it goes, it goes. Instead of a slipway, the team have already loaded the vessel onto self-propelled modular trailers to get the 2,000-tonne ship onto a semi-submersible barge, which will carry it downriver where it will submerge and the OPV will float free. So to move the ship, we've got 80 axles, that means uh, 80 rows of wheels, four rows wide, and they're moving on CAMAG SPMTs, self-propelled modular trailers. And the trailers can rise and fall as well, so while we're driving over the bridge that takes us onto the barge, the trailers kind of compensate and keep the barge all nice and level. They might look small, but each axle can take 30 tonnes. So, I mean, we've got well enough capacity to, to lift the ship today. HMS Trent is 13 metres wide and 90 metres long, sitting on 12 custom-built stands, each capable of holding around 200 tonnes. What's different to usual is that uh, the ship isn't actually in any sort of way welded or secured to the cradle. She's literally just sitting there and the shape of the cradle is kind of stopping or tipping out um, and sliding off uh, forward or aft. Heather must get the 2,000 tonne vessel safely onto the barge without it slipping off its stands. 
the SPMT transporters must get across a narrow temporary bridge known as a link span, which must be as flat as possible. Link spans might look quite small. Um, they are just, you know, essentially the width of the trailer and they're not very thick. They're only about 200 mil thick. The Clyde estuary is tidal, with water levels varying by up to five metres. But the tide is rising faster than expected, lifting the barge higher and making the temporary metal bridge too steep to get the vessel on board. At the moment, the deck edge of the barge is supposed to only be about 20, 30 centimetres above the key level, but actually we're more like half a metre because uh, the tide's coming a bit faster. Um, so the problem that it might cause is the ramps are quite steep now um, and the trailers need them a little bit more flat to, to roll over. Seawater must be pumped on board to lower it down and transport supervisor George Hill needs to be on standby to move the trailers as soon as the barge is low enough. The tide's starting to surge at the minute, which means for us we'll just start to roll on a little bit earlier than expected. The transporter is 67 metres long and all four sections need to communicate with each other for remote control steering. But there's a problem with the hydraulic power pack which drives the transporters. The tide is continuing to rise rapidly. If George and his team don't find the problem soon, the 2,000-ton ship won't get on the barge and the launch of the Royal Navy's newest addition will be in jeopardy. 430 miles south on the southern coast of England, Southampton. The UK's number one export port, handling 14 million tonnes of cargo a year, worth 40 billion pounds. It's also a vital link between Britain and the Channel Islands. 130 miles away, Guernsey and Jersey are heavily dependent on imports of food and essential goods from the UK. The Channel Islands are obviously totally reliant on the UK for supplying everything that we take for granted over here. They're on an island, it has to be shipped out there. General Manager Barry Goshawk is preparing to load 600 tonnes of vital supplies for the 165,000 people living on Jersey and Guernsey. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure this is it. It's on flat 295. At the heart of the service, the Channel Island Line's Hewlin Dispatch, an 89 metre long, 2,600 tonne bulk cargo vessel sailing across the English Channel three times a week. So this is the dockside. Our vessel is due in in about an hour. Uh, so she'll, she'll moor up here and be tied up here. Obviously, you've got both cranes there. One end does Jersey, the other end does Guernsey. The Hewland Dispatch operates 24 hours a day, but a fuel pump problem has delayed her arrival. Unfortunately, today the vessel's running a little bit late. Uh, she had some engine problems yesterday, so we're going to be a bit under pressure. Whereas she's normally in at six, seven o'clock in the morning, she's running at 10 o'clock today, and we need to get her over five o'clock. She needs to be into Jersey at uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, so we're under a bit of pressure to get her away, get her loaded on the way very quickly. A dockside team of forklift drivers, crane operators and slingers need to load 120 containers and flatbeds across three decks in just seven hours. There is a lot of riding on this because people could be sitting in the islands waiting for these, these goods. There could be a building under construction which they, they has to halt because of this. Obviously there, there are repercussions if we don't ship on time, there could be costs involved in that. There is a pressure to, to produce the goods at the end of the day. At 10 o'clock, the Hewland Dispatch arrives in Southampton three hours late. All right, so the boat's just arrived. It's just been uh, tied up. The cranes will now come into action. They'll take out all the empty units which will come back, empty containers and flatbeds, which possibly we need now to load freight onto to ship them back out again. I've got uh, oxygen and uh, gases ready for the hospitals. Obviously that, that's a, quite a priority because that's uh, quite important. Tanks are just coming down here, which is a tank of fuel. That'll be an empty coming down now, but we ship the uh, you know, diesel and all the fuel for the planes over there for the airport. 
With 120 empty units back on shore, they can begin to load the bottom deck with the flatbeds and six tanks of highly inflammable aviation fuel. We uh, ship some fuel tanks out as well from very heavy. Uh, the uh, weight of the fuel tanks is quite relevant because they have to balance the boat. The ship's been specially adapted by owner and captain Frank Allen to carry such a dangerous cargo. We have a contract for the aviation fuel for Jersey Airport because this ship has CO2 fitted and hold. Uh, she specialises in carrying these hazardous cargoes. Onboard tanks pump out carbon dioxide that make a layer of inert gas to prevent fire or explosion. This is the container plan, and you can input the various decks on the ship and move in all the weights, and the weights will come from the tally man and the second mate will input all the information to you. And when that's complete, they'll work out the stability of the vessel and make sure she's safe to go to sea. In the hold, the flat packs are pinned to the deck, and they're relying on crane driver Craig Berry to get them tightly packed. You've got to be obviously aware of the other crane and uh, there's a lot of fork work on the floor now. You've got to be always a bit vigilant on this, but you've just got to be on the ball. With the bottom deck nearly full, the middle tween deck is built on top with steel pontoons, which must be secure to provide a safe platform for the aviation fuel known dockside as Avgas. I've got to move this uh, pontoon, because when I put the half gas down, the pontoon like, moved a little bit. So obviously, why these cleats that hold them up is out a little bit. Perfect. But the engine trouble that delayed the ship from the Channel Islands overnight has not gone away. We just found out from the boat that they've got a problem with a fuel pump. Unfortunately, the tank that actually powers the engine is the one that we haven't got the fuel in at the moment. Uh, the quick fix to this is to get more fuel. If the ship's to leave on time, they need 3,000 litres of marine gas oil for the second tank or a rapid repair of the fuel pump. OK, so that was the uh, fuel supply company. Uh, they can't get the fuel to us before 5 o'clock, uh, so that could be an issue. So I'm going to have a chat with the boat, uh, see where we are, the repairs. A late fuel delivery will put the Hewlin dispatch even further behind schedule. I've spoken to the fuel people. Okay. Uh, they probably aren't going to get you by five o'clock. Yeah. They say more like half past six. Whatever. Is the well, fault might, not might, fixable? We're on it. Barry needs a solution fast, or the whole shipment to the Channel Islands is in jeopardy. What we're going to do? They're obviously working on the problem and hopefully going to fix it, which will be the number one scenario. As a backup, we need to put that in place. So we, we've, we've ordered the fuel. You know, if, if it turns out we don't need it, it's a risk we're going to have to take. It is a high-pressure situation, and uh, there is never a dull moment here. In West Scotland, at the Govan Shipyard in Glasgow, the Royal Navy's latest offshore patrol vessel is waiting to be launched. The 2,000-ton ship has taken over two and a half years to build and needs to be moved onto a semi-submersible barge and taken down the Clyde River to the deep water dock where it'll be floated for the first time. In active service, it'll patrol British borders and conduct counter-terrorism activities. You got it. Lift supervisor George Hill has already pulled HMS Trent out of the build shed using an 80-axle self-propelled modular trailer. But today, the high-tech units aren't talking to each other, so it won't start. Just putting the coordinates in for each trailer so it knows uh, where each one of the fours are in a uh, configuration. 2240 is front right in it. Yeah. <laughs> Happy George. All working now, we uh, Smile on the face, you see. No panic. Thanks to George manually programming the trailers, he and operator Dave Hathaway can now attempt to get the 2,000-ton ship across the metal ramps connecting the barge to the quay. Go for diagonal, mate, and stay to your left. 
one metre to the ramp now. Start coming up at the front a little bit, mate. Come up at the front. Just go into normal, mate, and steer a touch to your right. Right, oh, mate, keep coming as you are now. But the tide is still rising rapidly, and the rollout stopped while naval architect Heather Crockett adjusts the amount of seawater on the barge to keep it level with the quay. Righto, Dave, hold it there, mate. Put a bit of service brake on. The Dina Launcher is a 91-metre-long, 28-metre-wide semi-submersible barge. Below deck, it has empty ballast tanks that can be filled with seawater to adjust its height and allow it to totally submerge and float HMS Trent when she arrives at the deep water dock. The SPMT trailers will need to land the vessel millimetre perfect on the specially designed grillage beams. We've got our grillage beams, so as the trailers drive on, they will kind of duck down and leave the ship sitting on top of these beams. The SPMT has computer controlled axles each with hydraulic suspension and the ability to turn 270 degrees, driven by one operator using a remote control. Come up on your front left to touch, mate, up on your front left. It's a crucial stage of the operation. With just 10 centimetres either side of the transporter, oh, mate, hold that. George has minimal margin for error. It's up to make sure the barge stays left with the key. Just checking the grillage is quite tight on the side. Got 100 mil to play with. But as the vessel and trailer add weight to the back of the Dina launcher, seawater must be pumped into the ballast tanks at the front of the barge. Right, cheers, mate. Just come down a little bit at the back end. The horizontal beams at the base of the cradles running left to right must be lined up perfectly with the landing points on the grillage beams. I've got to watch everything. There's 80 axles in the combination. There's not a lot of room on the sides. I've got to check the level between the grillage uh, on the other side of the ship. So, yeah, busy job. Yeah. You can never sort of turn your back. When you turn your back, that's when something's going to catch you. But um, obviously, when you're moving things like this, there's not a lot of room and there's a lot going on. You've got to keep on top of everything and, uh, and look, because the slightest thing can ruin a big operation like this. So it's important to keep on top of it. After two and a half hours, just before 11 o'clock, the 2,000-tonne vessel is hovering just millimetres above the landing points. So that's our mark there, that one edge of this beam to line up with. And that's the mark there, that one that edge to line up with. So we'll take that a little bit closer and then we'll do a quick walk just to make sure all the corners match and then we'll put it down. OK, mate, hold it there, hold it there. Go straight. Right, now hold that. HMS Trent is now just five millimetres off landing on the barge. But Heather needs to pack out any final gaps with plywood, known as shimming, so there's no steel-on-steel -steel contact to avoid slipping. We're just walking round and looking to see if there's any gaps, just so that when it eventually goes out to sea, there's all good contact at all points. It's looking good. Just, uh, just a few to shim in. By 12 o'clock, the HMS Trent is in place. She'll sit here for another day or so, where we'll install some sea fastening so that she can go to sea and just holds the, the ship in place. Then we will tour down river and we tour through a deep water berth. And that's where we then submerge the barge down and the ship will float up. The float off operation is a real biggie. Um, it's the one everyone wants to watch. Um, so when everyone panics about. In two days, the Dina launcher and her 100 million pound cargo will be towed down the River Clyde. But the Scottish weather is unpredictable and high winds could jeopardize the move. In Southampton, the Hewland dispatch cargo ship is due to leave at five o'clock and head out to the Channel Islands with vital supplies. General Manager Barry Goshawk is under pressure to get 120 containers and flatbed loads on board. The clock is always ticking. 
I'm not panicking yet. If in two hours this is all sitting there exactly like this, then yes, I, I will be getting anxious. With the middle tween deck now full, the concertina top deck can be spread out into position, ready to take the last containers. But a pump that transfers fuel between tanks on the ship is not working. She can't leave unless it's fixed, or she gets more fuel in her reserve tank. While the repair team assess the problem, the loading of the top deck continues. And by mid-afternoon, the mechanics have made a breakthrough. Uh, so it's now uh, half past three. Uh, thankfully, they've managed to repair the, the problem on the boat. We've cancelled the fuel delivery, uh, so we're still on target now to get her away for five o'clock. With the fuel pump fixed, it's down to first mate Alistair Ellis to plot their course for the challenging 12-hour, 130-mile crossing to the Channel Islands. So this is the route we take across. You can see and this is the northeastbound lane and this is the southwestbound lane. Crossing that shipping lane, it, it can be very busy. By five o'clock, the dockside team have completed the load-up. 120 containers on board across three decks in seven hours. All loaded, ready to go. I have clearance outbound, the aft line's gone, and we're going to start to pull off the key. Now I'm going to make the signal to let everybody know we're moving astern. <laughs> Leaving the berth can be one of the most stressful parts, but in the English Channel, it's, it's very much like a motorway. As you approach the, the shipping lane, you'll start to pick up the international regulations for the prevention of collisions at sea, which is what everybody at sea follows. So they, they state that when we're, as we're crossing the shipping lane, we're essentially crossing two lanes of motorway. By five o'clock, the eight-man crew are on their way with a satisfying 1,000 tonnes of cargo for Captain Frank Allen. You, this lady can feed two islands three times a week with, with their furniture and their dry goods and everything else. It's, it's a way of life, isn't it? Uh, and actually being able to put the whole project together and run it, it gives you a great buzz. Leaving Southampton, it's a 130-mile journey across one of the busiest shipping routes in the world. Up to 500 ships a day sailing east and west must be avoided en route to St. Helier in Jersey. After an 11-hour crossing, the Hewland Dispatch has made it safely into St. Helier Harbour, an hour ahead of schedule. And from the lower decks, the crucial aviation fuel for the airport is carefully offloaded. Just one of around 15 tanks delivered by the ship every week. That's good, a bit tight down here, mate. Do you want to on top of the furniture with all containers? Yes, please, mate. That's fine, Steve. Five hours after they arrived, Alistair can guide his deck crew and the rest of the cargo out of St. Helier Harbour and on towards Guernsey. 165,000 people rely on the Hewlin Dispatch and her crew. A call of duty for Frank Allen, the very last of his kind, who owns and captains his own cargo ship. I'm the last captain owner in the British Isles. My father used to say to me, why didn't I go into banking? Because I would have made a lot of money. And I said, well, because I, I like ships, and that's the reason I'm in it, you know. It's a kind of a labour of love. That's how I can describe it, as a labour of love. Govan Shipyard, Glasgow. The Royal Navy's latest offshore patrol vessel, HMS Trent, has been loaded and fastened to a semi-submersible barge. It needs to be towed one and a half miles down the river to a deep water berth, so it can be floated and launched for the first time. But it's windier than expected. It's a beautiful day. Who doesn't love working out in the rain and the wind? Heather Crockett spent two years preparing for the move, and the tugs are on standby. But the only element she can't predict is the weather. 
it's only safe to move the 100 million pound vessel if the wind is below 29 miles an hour. It's quite a fresh day, a bit windier than we would have liked, uh, but it's still within limits. So our limit for moving down river is 25 knots and we're sitting about 18 gusting 20. But at the last minute, the wind unexpectedly gathers pace to 24 knots, 27 miles an hour. The HMS Trent is sitting around 27 metres high and acts like a giant sail, a problem for navigation pilot Gillen Locke. We've got 90 metres of a flat side, so the wind's pushing on that very large surface area is going to push us down onto the other side of the dock, uh, which is where we do not want to end up. Heather needs to assess the risk with the team. I don't think we want to risk damaging the barge or the fact that there's guys working over there. Yeah, the critical bit's getting out of here. Just... There is a risk of damage to the barge. But barge master Chris Spencer thinks the tugs can cope with the wind. We're right on the limits, but I believe there's plenty of power in the tugboats. OK. Are you in agreement? Yeah, there's power there. It's just as long as everyone's got... It's just that the odd space. gust. Yeah. Our limit for the move is uh, 21 tw gusting 25 knots, and we're kind of sitting about 24 knots gusting 30. Um, so we're just over the limits. With the winds just under the maximum allowed for the move, it's a critical moment. Heather must call the owners, BAE Systems, to discuss whether they can move the ship in conditions verging on unsafe. OK, so uh, we just had a bit of a team talk there with the, the client and the warranty severe. They're not comfortable with us taking it out into the river um, in wind speeds that are higher than what the documentation says. Um, so we're just basically going to knock it on the head for the day. Heather must make a difficult announcement to the team. Yeah, we just had a word from the client there. Um, they're not happy with us taking it out into the river over limits. So, lines back on, please. OK, Ronnie, did you catch that? Yeah, I caught most of it. Is that why? I'll just take it back on then, yeah? I'm afraid so. Yep, no problem. I'll head over get it. It's a huge blow. Yeah. We're at the top end of the limit, so, yeah, it's, it it's makes tough. sense. Yeah. Months of planning have just been thrown up in the air, and Heather's left to pick up the pieces. Bit of a bit of a pain for the day. Uh, makes my day a bit more stressful than it needs to be. We can plan absolutely everything except the weather. You know, the weather is what the weather is. Heather must spend the rest of the day seeing if the constantly in-demand tugs will be available to try again in the next few days. Uh, I don't know if you are updated on the situation, but the move today got aborted due to weather. Until she can reschedule the whole operation, the offshore patrol vessel remains stuck on the barge. The launch of the Royal Navy's brand new ship postponed indefinitely. Quorn, Leicestershire. The Great Central Railway. An eight mile long restored stretch of track running through the Midlands south of Loughborough to Leicester. On the move, the Witherslack Hall, a steam locomotive originally built in 1948 and recently restored. But today, she'll be the passenger on a road trip. Heavy haulage specialists, Alla Lease, have arrived to take the locomotive 180 miles south to Bishop's Lydiard, where it'll be the star attraction at the West Somerset Railway Steam and Vintage Rally in two days' time. Eric Harrison and the team need to winch the Witherslack Hall onto the trailer in under two hours to depart by 3 p.m. and avoid driving the oversized load in the dark. Sounds easy. <laughs> it's down to experience. We've moved hundreds of these and each loco is slightly different. I think we're almost about 115 tonnes with this on board. I think the loco weighs about 70 tonnes. The Witherslack Hall took 10 years to restore and is now worth half a million pounds. She weighs 75 tonnes, is 19 metres long, nearly 3 metres wide and 4 metres high. To get the locomotive on the trailer, they need to extend a 10 metre long 
slowly inclining track from the back of the hydraulic platform transporter. We line up the rails which are built into the trailer with the rails that are on the floor. With the rails in place, the winch can be attached to the 70-year-old engine. It's a very old loco. You've got to treat it with a bit of respect and uh, make sure that you don't put weight where it doesn't want to go. You've got to keep it all level as you can. She spent the 1950s running at over 70 miles an hour, taking commuters between London and Manchester. But her progress onto the trailer is more leisurely. And just as she reaches her final position, there's a problem. You broke it, did you? Yeah. Which one was it? The trailer has seven rows of four wheels, enabling it to go round corners but a steering arm on one of the axles is broken. I can't pull back off this wheel, can I? If it can't be fixed, the trailer won't be able to turn properly. It's all works on the front end, so all these axles steer, in. so as you turn a sharp corner or whatever, or roundabout, they all sort of turn at the right angle. So if you haven't got that steering arm in, you won't have any steer on the back. It's a setback. The steam railway fair in Somerset begins in just two days' time. If the steering arm can't be fixed or replaced with a spare, the Witherslack Hall won't be getting to Somerset anytime soon. And the vintage railway event will be denied their 70-year-old star attraction. Monday morning, in the west of Scotland, on the River Clyde in Glasgow. Marine architect Heather Crockett has loaded the Royal Navy's latest offshore patrol vessel, HMS Trent, onto a barge and needs to tow it downriver where it will be launched. The first attempt was aborted due to high winds. We're itching to get going. Nobody wants any more delays. We've been delayed by two days so far. The weather's absolutely perfect. The sun's shining. Most importantly, the winds dropped right down. The water's pretty much flat calm. Yeah, a perfect day for a move downriver. HMS Trent needs to be towed from the roll-on, roll-off quay, one and a half miles downriver by three tugs, to the King George V deep water berth, known as KG5, where she'll be launched for the first time by floating her off the barge. Morning, chaps. Two box talk before we start the move for today. Um, obviously, the move is from Roro Key down to KG5 float off berth. In charge of getting the Dina launcher down the River Clyde is navigation pilot Gillan Locke, on the barge and in control of what direction all three tugs push and pull. That's, uh, the bruiser are all fast, thank you. By 11 o'clock, Bruiser and Battler can get in position to pull her away from the quayside. Yeah, Battler, uh, when you come in, leave enough space for the warrior to, uh, to fit in. OK. With Battler and Bruiser in position, some of the mooring ropes can be released to make room for the third tug called Warrior. Yeah, Bruiser, just... Uh, we're all clear wires now, so we should be uh, in position to start making a move. Finally, at 11 o'clock, two days behind schedule, the tugs can begin to tow the Dina launcher downriver. And we'll just uh, start getting the barge moving ahead. Three more, probably just three on the minimum now. Perfect, perfect. That's us off the berth. Um, warrior, tug will just move in at the stern here. We've got another tug on the bow, um, and we've just got a wee helper tug on the side. So the pilots are going to take her out into the river. It's a short journey, but on the River Clyde, even if the skies are blue, the wind can turn at a moment's notice. The main risk at the moment is if the, the wind just catches her and she takes a shear. Um, so we're just watching to see how, uh, how she sits within the river channel. Barge and ship combined have 1,500 square metres of surface area and the wind can easily push them off course. As we came round the small turn in the river, uh, the wind just pushed on the, uh, on the side of the barge, uh, so it just made the whole barge just very slowly 
uh, drift over the side of the channel. And despite two years of planning, an unexpected police diving exercise is under threat from the swirling water left behind by the 4,000 horsepower tug. I think that's a bit stupid to be in the water when we're moving about them, especially in the water that just under five metres of draft. Okay, advice from the pilot would be it would be more sensible to take the uh, diver out the water uh, just in case the barge does slide over. Yeah, go on, uh, they're going to take them out, they're taking them out just now. All received, thank you. Any time you do these things, you always expect the unexpected. With the human hazard avoided, the wind and current negotiated, they approached the King George V deep water dock after 30 minutes. Uh, so we're aiming up. Um, you can see these big black rubber fenders. We're going to be putting the barge uh, just, just on the two of those. Nearly there, nearly there. Final stage now, final stage. Roughly 50 to go, Alan. Yeah, worry. Well, just uh, just take the speed off for a little bit. We don't arrive too fast. Heather is dockside and needs to get the barge perfectly lined up. Just need to pull it so that the fender wants to walk this way. How's that going? Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna dash up the forward end there and have a final check. Okay. Stand by, Gillen. Hi, hi. OK, Chris, she's all stopped. We're on the fenders, position-wise. Happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, that's us. We're safely alongside, so the barge is now on its berth on the fenders. Time to go home and, uh, yeah, feet up, have a cuppa and uh, relax. Tomorrow, the Dina launcher will be pumped full of seawater so it sinks to the bottom of the river and the HMS Trent can be floated for the first time. The team are already two days behind schedule and need the launch to go smoothly if the Royal Navy is to get its latest ship on time. Quorn and Woodhouse Rail Yard, Leicestershire. A 75-ton steam locomotive, the Witherslack Hall, is meant to be on the road to Somerset, but one of the steering arms on the trailer that allows it to go round corners is broken and has to be replaced. Now you got all the pipes on the way down. I thought maybe put your small hook down there. Yeah. Through, through you got all your pipes. Yeah. You've got it as far back as you can, really, haven't you? The spare steering arm finally works, and the trailer is safe for the road trip. Twelve rod and chain lashings are put in place, each one capable of securing 10 tonnes of weight. Your safety is paramount. We have to make sure that it's safe to go on the roads. Uh, you have an incident with this, it becomes a major problem for everybody. The loco needs to travel 180 miles south to Somerset. Along the way, they'll pass under motorway bridges, but at 16 foot high, that could be a problem. Well, the crucial part now, we have to uh, check the height of the trailer and load to make sure it's at a safe height to run on the motorway because obviously the height is quite critical. Could we need to get down to uh, around about 16 foot, 16 foot two maximum to run on the motorway. More than that, you're a bit close to the motorway bridges. Back in the old wow. days, we used to use a tape measure, which meant climbing up there and measuring, but health and safety nowadays, you can't climb up things like that. Yeah, it's around about 16 feet, that is. Let's get it back. The driver's cab looks much taller. But it's higher than I was hoping it was going to be. It just means we have to run the trailer quite low to the floor. Down a bit. The trailer has to be lowered to safely go under the bridges. But so close to the road, the journey's just become more hazardous. So lowering it right down, you're cutting down the axle travel. So if you go onto any bad cambers and all that, you've got to be careful. The locomotive was due to be delivered to Somerset by the end of the day. But the delay has put Eric two hours behind schedule, which means he's unlikely to be there before sunset. Well, you certainly get a lot of funny looks. Uh, people aren't used to seeing a steam engine on the back of a trailer. With one support vehicle, but no police escort, 
Eric and his team are solely responsible for public safety. You have to travel at the correct speeds, make sure that you've got plenty of stopping distance. At 60 miles an hour, Eric must allow at least 80 metres stopping distance to protect the half a million pound locomotive. You've got to be careful that you don't scratch them, get too close to overhanging trees and things like that. But the loco can't be offloaded in the dark. And as night falls, Eric and the engine have to overnight in a service station in Somerset. At first light, Eric is back on the road for the final few miles. The West Somerset Steam Gala begins in less than 24 hours. And Eric needs to get her there on time to be prepared and fired up, ready to roll. By 8 o'clock in the morning, the Witherslack Hall arrives safely at Bishop's Lydiard Station in Somerset. The offload overseen by steam fare organiser Stuart Nellums. We're always very pleased that the locomotive has arrived. Obviously, it's here on time for the event. Um, it's in one piece. Uh, we've just got to uh, hopefully get it off the lorry, do the inspections, and we're ready to roll. The loco needs to be ready to run on the track tomorrow. The next day, the Witherslack Hall is put through its paces and shown off to the avid fans at the West Somerset Steam Gala. Enthusiasts from across the country experiencing a piece of British engineering from the days when mega shipment was fueled by coal and powered by steam. In Glasgow, at the Deepwater Dockyard, naval architect Heather Crockett is preparing to launch the Royal Navy's latest patrol vessel. The ship will be offloaded by filling the semi-submersible barge with seawater to sink it and let HMS Trent float off its supports. Heather heads into the ballast control room to level out the Dina launcher. At 6.45 in the morning, after a two and a half year build costing millions of pounds, the sinking begins at the back of the barge. We started pumping in water about 30 minutes ago, so that's bringing the stern end of the barge down before the bow, um, so it's nice and controlled. Naval architect Jonathan Fettis keeps Heather in touch with where the barge is sitting against the waterline. Currently, Heather is up in the ballast control room. Um, she will be pumping the water into the stern of the barge and she will be bringing the stern down first. Three hours into submersion at 10 o'clock, the back of the barge is almost down. But the tide's not rising as fast as they were expecting known as a cut. Currently, the, uh, the stern is actually touching the bottom at the moment. Um, we have a slight uh, cut in the tide, um, so we've uh, stopped ballasting just to allow the tide to come up a wee bit more. The vessel is loose on the cradle. The angle is getting dangerously steep and they could lose control of the ship. Obviously, we don't want to ballast her down too much or the, the angle will cause a dynamic launch, which is not what we want. we would become a point where the friction that is holding the ship onto the cradles at the moment wouldn't be sufficient to hold the ship in place and she would actually start to slide off. There would be no way of holding her. They're relying on the rising tide to keep the vessel safe because after almost six hours of submersion, the barge can't get any lower. We're just sitting on the, the seabed at the moment, um, waiting for the tide to come up um, to float the OPV off nice and level. While they wait for the tide, navigation pilot Gillen Locke returns to supervise the tugs that'll pull her clear of the barge. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So the overall plan is to take the patrol vessel off the barge and move it astern to this berth where the rubber fenders are. So we'll have one tug on the bow, one tug on the stern. It's a highly risky manoeuvre. So what happens as we slide the patrol vessel out, uh, the clearance, uh, we're, we're, we're talking uh, about 20 centimetres, um, so we've got very small tolerance to work with. Heather needs to make sure the barge is level before the tugs pull HMS Trent clear of the cradle. We are happy with these drafts. 
Are you ready for us to start calling the tugs in then? Yes, please. The ship is yours. Okie dokie, thank you. The vessel will be towed free backwards, with a 2,000 horsepower tug Battler leading the float out. Okay, uh, Battler, Lawrence, just nice and gently, uh, just, just put a minimum weight on and we'll just start sliding up. With just 20 centimetres between the cradle and some of the fins attached to the hull, there's very little room for manoeuvre. The most important thing is keeping her parallel to the barge. And the wind's pushing her over to the left. Uh, the bow's gone over to port slightly because of the wind, so we're just holding on to this rope to bring the, the boat back central, because we've got to get through these cradles that you can see under the water down there. Yeah, happy of that. Back in the centre now, looking good. Uh, Baita, let me know uh, once you're clear of the castles and you're ready to uh, come in just on the starboard bow. After just 20 minutes, HMS Trent is out of her cradle. That's us clear of the barge now, so we're just going to line her up for the fenders and uh, we'll get her safely alongside. Cruiser all stop. OK, we're on the fenders. Cruiser minimum. Yeah, all done, all safely done. Um, she's outside the cradles, so that's uh, smooth. Uh, didn't touch anything, um, so that's, uh, that's what we like. After six days of manoeuvres, from a build shed to a launch site, HMS Trent is finally free on the water for the first time. Yeah, really successful day. That went absolutely fantastic. And the tug just had to squeeze a little bit through, but yeah, she went down a treat. In a couple of minutes, she'll be towed away back down to the, the shipyard where she's got about a year's worth of outfitting. And then she'll be handed over to the Royal Navy where she can go off and protect our great nation. HMS Trent is towed downriver for the next stage of her preparations. She's destined to become part of a fleet of five river-class offshore patrol vessels in service with the Royal Navy by 2020.